What's up ladies and gentlemen, so today uh, we're going to do something a little bit different. We are going to talk about cemetery tourism, uh, what it is. We're going to talk about two specific uh, super interesting cemeteries in the northern Panhandle, West Virginia. And then we're just going to close by doing an overview of some of the rules and guidelines you should follow if this is something you're interested in looking into and if some of these places are places you want to visit. So there are numerous reasons why individuals uh, would want to get into cemetery tourism. I know I read an article probably about a month ago now because I'm so far behind on these videos. I read this article about cemetery tourism and how it actually saw an uptick in popularity in 2020, which kind of makes sense. Early last year, I was planning on visiting a lot of museums across the state of West Virginia, but when they all closed, one of the places that kept open uh, were cemeteries. So I was able to go to local cemeteries, use my knowledge of you know local history, West Virginia history, uh, you know, learn some things, come back home, do more research, uh, fill the gap. And a lot of people start doing that. You know, people visit cemeteries for historical reasons, uh, genealogical reasons, um, architectural reasons. They're like museums, but they're outside and there's no gift shops. But seriously, like never take anything from a cemetery. Uh, if you do, you really have no right to complain when things start moving around in your house, the lights flicker on and off, the walls start bleeding, and small animatronic Dutch children keep you awake at night with singing. I think I just got poltergeist and it's a small world mixed up again. Now there are various cemeteries across the state of West Virginia that if you love West Virginia history, um, I would definitely recommend you visit, but today we're going to focus on two in the Northern Panhandle, West Virginia, those specifically being uh, the Whitegate Cemetery right outside of Moundsville, West Virginia, and the Peninsula Cemetery in Wheeling, West Virginia. The Whitegate Cemetery is filled with all the unclaimed inmates uh, that died at the penitentiary. Uh, it's often referred to as the tomb of the unclaimed inmate. Now, up until around the end of the 19th century, uh, prisoners were buried in a little stretch of land uh, inside the prison yard, actually within you know the walls, the compounds of the penitentiary. Uh, due to various factors, most likely water drainage problems, uh, this practice had to be stopped and prisoners were then buried in nearby cemeteries. Uh, many residents of Moundsville were actually upset by this practice. So in 1897, House Bill 255 was passed, which banned the penitentiary from burying inmates within Moundsville city limits. Shortly after that, a small piece of land was purchased right outside um, the town of Moundsville along Tom's Run Road, only about four miles away from the penitentiary. So it was fairly close, but it was still outside of city limits. And eventually this piece of land would become known as the White Gate Cemetery. And it's a pretty surreal experience. You know, all of the markers are just pieces of sheet metal with the names and the dates sprawled on them. And like many other things at the time, uh, these markers were actually produced uh, at the penitentiary by inmates. Some 300 individuals are buried at the White Gate, many simply because their families weren't able to afford to have their bodies shipped uh, back home, especially during the Great Depression. By far the most infamous resident of the White Gate is Harry Powers, uh, regarded by many to be West Virginia's first serial killer and the inspiration for the movie and novel uh, Night of the Hunter. The last inmate buried at the White Gate was one James Lee Burkhammer, who was buried there in 2001, which is some five years after the penitentiary officially closed. I wasn't able to find a lot of information about this individual, most likely, uh, he had done some time at the penitentiary. The penitentiary closed. He was shipped to, I believe, the St. Mary's 
uh, regional jail. And then once he passed away, he was buried at the White Gate. Now, if you travel the state of West Virginia, you might actually be lucky enough to find one of these markers in another cemetery because the law only banned the burying of inmates within Moundsville city limits. And there are instances during this time period of inmates working on various public works projects across the state. There's at least a dozen cases where while on these work projects, uh, inmates would die, or in a couple cases, there were like escape attempts where inmates were shot and killed, uh, and then were buried at local cemeteries. Now, while we're in the northern panhandle, let's talk about the Peninsula Cemetery of Wheeling, West Virginia, which probably has one of the weirdest slash tragic stories. So at one point, the Peninsula Cemetery was one of the largest uh, cemeteries in the entire state of West Virginia. The cemetery officially opened in the 1840s on over 20 acres of land, and everything was going pretty all right um, up until the 1890s when there was a smallpox epidemic that swept through the Ohio River Valley. It was so bad that the city of Wheeling erected what they called a pest house at the top of the hill of the Peninsula Cemetery. Basically, if you lived in Wheeling uh, and you caught smallpox, they would quarantine you to the pest house and you were kind of expected to take care of and dispose of uh, other victims of this smallpox outbreak. Now, it's estimated that during this one smallpox outbreak alone, a couple hundred people ended up buried at the Peninsula Cemetery in non-properly marked graves. Now, keep that in mind because that detail is going to come up a little bit later. Eventually, at some point in the 1930s, the pest house was torn down, and by the 1940s, people of the city of Wheeling had started complaining about the condition of parts of the cemetery, especially the area around the old pest house and the potter's field where most of these individuals uh, had ended up being buried. By the 1960s, the Peninsula Cemetery had over 1,700 marked graves. This doesn't include the other couple hundred we already talked about. In the 1960s, late 1960s, that's when the Interstate 70 project was announced, and it was decided that over 100 Mark Graves would have to be exhumed and their markers and residents relocated to various other cemeteries across Wheeling. When the I-70 project started, uh, the Peninsula Cemetery was almost immediately split into two different cemeteries. You have the Manchester Cemetery, which some would say never actually got reestablished properly. Um, it was just kind of stranded on the other side, the far side of the I-70 project and the Peninsula Cemetery. Were all the fine folks buried at the Peninsula Cemetery respectfully and properly relocated? Allegedly. Considering in the 1940s, some 20, 25 years before this project even started, people were complaining about the condition and the inability to differentiate where different people were buried. Um, I'm gonna guess that no. In fact, I would almost go as far as to say, and this is just some speculation here, that the city of Wheeling probably decided, hey, here's a part of the cemetery that has been deemed problematic. People won't stop complaining about it. Let's just tear it up for the interstate project, and that's two problems solved. If I had to describe where the Peninsula Cemetery is located, it's right off Route 250, right off, I believe, what's known as the McCulloch Street exit um, of I-70. For those of you who are familiar with Wheeling, 
Uh, that's the part of I-70 right before the tunnels where there's always delays, always accidents, and if you've ever spent any amount of time in the Wheeling area, you've probably been stuck in traffic in the section of Wheeling. Yet, yeah, that section of I-70 was built right on top of the Peninsula Cemetery. Now, allegedly, uh, there's absolutely no connection between all the wrecks and traffic delays on this section of I-70 right for the Wheeling Tunnel. Uh, there's absolutely no connection between that and the fact that this section of the interstate it was built directly on top of the Peninsula Cemetery. Allegedly, those two things are completely unrelated. Um, anyways, this was just two cemeteries uh, in the northern panhandle of West Virginia that if cemetery tourism is something you would like to get into, I would definitely suggest you check out. There are a general list of guidelines and rules if you do want to get into cemetery tourism. 99% of them are just simple, don't be a jerk rules, follow the rules as far as the posted hours, don't be going to you know cemeteries after dark, especially some of these older, uh, historically significant ones, uh, obey all traffic rules and laws, don't park in a way that blocks traffic, uh, don't bother other people. If you see them in the cemetery, you don't know what they're doing there. They might be there for historical reasons. They might be there you know, for mourner reasons. Be respectful of others, especially if there is a active funeral going on or some type of procession. Again, just basic don't be a jerk rules. Nothing too difficult to follow. Anyways, until next time, I hope you enjoyed this, but don't forget to stay wild and stay wonderful. And if you like this, I'll definitely do some more of these. I think I went to like eight or nine cemeteries last year and I've never gone to talk about any of them because there's not really enough content there to do an entire video uh, just about any one specific cemetery. But until next time, have a good one.